Okay, so uh, we start this week and our focus is going to be on trying to understand CFT in two dimensions and uh, we will see how to go about doing this. We saw a little bit uh, in the previous class and I'm just trying to readjust my screen, which is proving to be a little difficult. Give me a second. Okay, anyway, I think it'll do for now. Um, more people. Let me ask, uh, start by asking you if you have any questions regarding uh, what we did briefly last time around. And um, again, if there are no questions, no immediate questions, uh, then I'll go ahead. Um, but let me also uh, let me also just mention to you that in between, if you have problems regarding anything, and if you want to talk to me about something, uh, you just drop me an email, and we should be able to chat as well. So uh, in this in this lecture and the following uh, few lectures, we are well. Uh, Basically, most of the course from now on, we are going to be interested in conformal invariance in d equal to two. And uh, as I stressed earlier last time, that conformal invariance in d equal to two is actually special and central to our understanding of various things. This includes string theory. And we have already seen from before that d equal to two actually needs special, uh, special care. And we will see that there are actually infinite number of corner transformations that are locally uh, yeah, I mean locally conformal. <clears throat> These are holomorphic mappings of the complex plane onto itself. So we, we saw that how the, uh, <laughs> I mean, cauchy riemann conditions for holomorphic functions appears last time around. I'm going to take you through a slightly different route, route route today and show you the same things as well okay so okay so what we are going to do so we are going to give this another look and let us start by remembering uh, what we did for the usual case okay so what we uh, did for the uh, generic case in d dimensions was that we looked at these infinitesimal transformations and these infinitesimal transformations were of this particular form. So somebody is here again. Let me just admit. Yeah. So we had this uh, infinitesimal form of, of this, and we, we wrote down uh, these two equations and an requirement that this uh, conformal transform, I mean, this transformation was <laughs> conformal. I mean, essentially meant that you had these these two equations. Now, these were true for any uh, any dimension d. So, what we're going to do is we're going to take d equal to two and see what happens. Okay. So then, this factor out here just 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 becomes one. And uh, so let's let's see. Let's go back and look at our equation. So the two equations that emerge from here are the following. Um, So this essentially becomes for d equal to two, this becomes del zero epsilon zero equal to del one epsilon one and del zero epsilon one equal to minus del one epsilon zero. So what have we done? Again, to, to just get, get back at what, what we were saying earlier is that there is this equation. So uh, shuttling back and forth is not proving to be as easy as I thought. But uh, you know, let let me write this down. This this equation is del mu epsilon mu plus del mu epsilon mu is equal to uh, del rho epsilon rho into eta mu nu. That is what we are doing. And so what what happens is that so what we find is for you know there is del zero epsilon zero. Uh, plus del one epsilon one, if you wish. So mu equal to mu equal to one, that is going to be equal to del zero epsilon zero plus del one epsilon one. Uh, I'm getting something wrong. 
uh, you you need to put put things upstairs and and downstairs as well and what what you'll find is so this this one is zero zero so you can this is becoming an identity but okay so let let let, let me not not be uh, cavalier with this all all i'm saying is that you uh, look at this equation and uh, you look at this equation and this equation and you put uh, you know d d equal to uh, d equal to 2 put the two indices in and what you're going to get uh, which i will leave as a small exercise because i'm messing up some fact some signs here at the moment uh, is that you're you're going to get uh, your equations at the end of the day are going to become del 0 epsilon 0 is equal to del 1 epsilon 1 and del not epsilon 1 is minus del 1 epsilon 1. These are, of course, the things that we saw earlier, these, I mean, CR, CR conditions. And remember that a complex function whose real and imaginary parts satisfy this equation in 3.7 is a, a holomorphic function in some set. So we can also write epsilon is epsilon not plus i epsilon one and epsilon bar is epsilon not minus i epsilon one. Now let's let's uh, let's uh, look at this again. Uh, so if epsilon z is holomorphic, that means if you are looking at a function f of z, which is uh, z plus epsilon z. This is also uh, I mean holomorphic function, right? So what is going to happen? is that a holomorphic function f of uh, z, which is z plus epsilon z, this is going to give rise to an infinitesimal conformal transformation of z goes to f of z. So, the, so this, this is what is go going, going to happen. So the infinitesimal form of this, uh, <laughs> I mean, conformal transformation will be f of z is z plus some, some small, small epsilon z, okay? Now, if you look at the line element ds squared, uh, that's that's just dz. I mean dz bar. So this this you can easily see from the fact that you can you can take uh, you know what what did we do earlier? We we said that you know there was z one uh, and and uh, sorry z naught and z one. So we 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 had said if you remember earlier, so we had said that these were true. Right, and we also know that ds squared, ds squared is uh, sorry. This just goes off. I'm sorry. Okay, so ds squared, as you know, uh, is going to be d uh, z naught squared plus uh, d z one squared in this case. So this in these sort of coordinates is just going to be d z d z bar. Very good. So, uh, so now, so if you look at this infinitesimal transformation, what is going to happen? What is going to happen is the following: uh, we are going to see that the the factor in front of it is going to be uh, df dz df bar dz bar. So the scale factor, in a sense, is the modulus of this guy. Okay. Very good. So these are infinitesimal coordinate, uh, uh, I mean, infinitesimal uh, conformal transformations. So now uh, we want to figure out what exactly the algebra of, uh, I mean, of the, uh, of, the gen of the generators of this uh, uh, conformal transformations. So for this, what we will do is that we will look at, uh, so what, what we will do is, uh, we've already seen this, that, uh, you know, we have said that EZ is going to be, I mean, holomorphic in some open set. What we will do in, in general is that we are going to assume EZ is actually meromorphic with some isolated singularities, which lie outside this uh, open set, okay? And we'll perform a LoRa expansion of, I mean, epsilon Z around Z equal to zero. All right, that's what we are going to do. So uh, there's a Z not true and Z not sitting here. Let me get rid of it. 
So what, what does that say? So what we are going to do is we are going to look at something which is uh, you know, a, a transformation out of this. Okay, there's somebody with a mic on. Could If it's not a problem, could you try and switch that off, please? Thank you. Okay, so what we are going to do is we are going to look at an infinitesimal uh, transformation of Z going to Z prime. Z prime is Z plus epsilon Z. So as we said, this epsilon Z, so we're, we're going to do a sort of <laughs> LoRa expansion of this. And that is going to give us a series of, of you know, this expanded out, which is going to be epsilon N, which is some, some I mean, uh, some, some constant and z z to the n plus one okay this is uh, this is what the expansion is is going to look like so it's like z plus z squared plus z cubed plus so on and so forth okay and similarly for the z bars as well now uh, remember that you have got a transformation like this and so if you have a transformation like this what is going to be the i mean infinitesimal uh, so so what is going to be the generator of this particular transformation the generator of you know the this uh, you know let's 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 look at this guy first is going to be just uh, you know z to the n plus one yeah, delta z how how do you see this for example this is uh, this is uh, of course very simple so so you know so what what you need uh, what you can do is uh, you want to look at z prime which is exponential sum uh, you know I times alpha into say uh, L, if you wish. Let's 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 call these guys L n. So alpha n L n. So let's 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 take one of the guys. Okay. Let's 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 take L n. Okay. And uh, so this is uh, so this is going to be something times z. And let's say L m and this this particular mode as we have uh, written out there is minus uh, z to the r m plus one del z. So you see, if you I mean operate it, it on this, so this becomes either the minus i alpha um, minus z to the m plus one del z here and this acting on z. Uh, I've put some i's and so on. Uh, but uh, if you expand this out, then this becomes one minus i alpha z to the m plus one del z acting on z. So this becomes one minus. Let me get my factors right. So there's uh, get this minus, and I put an i. Let let me actually not put these i's out here. Okay, you you can put some factors of i. You cannot. Uh, you you might may, may not put some. Uh, factors of i and for the moment let me get rid of this factor of i uh, we we uh, i mean we will see that this sort of is is related to if you want to make your uh, generators permission or not but let's let's keep that for later i just wanted to show you the fact that you know if you get get rid i mean if, if you have a, a generator of this form then what this leads to uh, modulo this factor of i which i uh, you know, I'm a little, uh, you know, un, un careful about most of the time. This just gives you z z to the m plus one. So this one is going to give you z, uh, and we are we are we are going to have this. So so you see, it generates a. I mean transformation so delta z if you wish which is z minus z bar z prime minus z is alpha times z to the n plus one right so there's a sign so so you see that this you know if you if you look at a particular but but uh, particular particular generator like this this is going to uh, give you uh, this this particular uh, you know uh, this is this is going to uh, generate for you I mean, transformation like this. Okay, that was what what I wanted to just uh, quickly show you. So these uh, generators out here are are going to be important for us. Okay, uh, it's important that we put the uh, factor of minus out there. We'll see that what's what's in a moment. 
Now, as you see, uh, so the number of independent uh, conformal transformations in this particular case is going to be infinite because what you have is uh, you, you have something, you, you, you had a uh, LoRa expansion and, and you know, to completely determine a, f a function in some neighborhood, this, this particular series has to be infinite dimensional. And so, you know, uh, these are going to be defined for all n. So the number of independent conformal transformations is thus infinite, okay? This is what is special in t equal to two. And now that we have got this form of these particular uh, generators, like, like we did last time around, what we want to do is we want to figure out what the algebra for these guys is. And that's also very easy to do. So you take the brackets of L's with uh, LM with LN, and then what you find is uh, you just do, do the algebra. So in the sense that you are going to find that the first term, so you know, you act, you act this guy on this. So, so this is the first term that you're going to get, and then you're going to re reverse this, and this is the next, next term that you're going to get. So, you know, del Z brings down this factor of N plus one from here and del Z also brings down this factor of M plus one from here. When you do this, when, when you subtract them, you are going to get an M minus N in front. And uh, because you had this minus sign to start things off with, you, you recognize that this power uh, is uh, Z to the N plus M plus one, and there's a sign out here. So this is nothing but L of N plus N, okay? So this algebra is what is going to be very important for us going forward. And you know, there is the thing with the L's, there is also the thing with the L bars, which generates a similar algebra here again. And L with L bar is equal to zero because we have said, you know, Z and Z bar are independent uh, yeah, independent uh, coordinates in this case. So what we get is called the wit algebra, okay? So this particular guy is, is called the wit algebra, okay? This is the wit algebra. So we have got two uh, commuting uh, copies of the wit algebra. So the algebra, as you can see, uh, in, in, for, of infinitesimal coordinate transformations, infinitesimal conformal transformations in d equal to two is in finite dimension, okay? All right, so, uh, so far, do you have any questions regarding this? Okay, let me just get rid of this page. Just give me a sec. Uh, real page. Okay. okay. Very good. So, uh, So we have ended up with the Witt algebra. So this is an infinite dimensional algebra for uh, two dimensional CFTs. Now let us try and focus on, uh, uh, you know, just the LNs and we are not, not gonna be speaking about the L bounds. Uh, on the complex plane, these are not, I mean, everywhere defined, okay? Uh, there's some ambiguity at z equal to zero. So it's, it's important to actually work not only on C, but on the Riemann sphere, which, is, uh, which also includes a point at that infinity. So this is, so, this is uh, I mean, as you guys know from your uh, complex analysis classes, this is a conformal compactification of R2, but still there will actually be, be, be some, some issues. So let's, let, let me try and address that. So let's look at z equal to zero first. So z equal to zero, ln is given by z, z to the n uh, plus one del z. So when you are at z equal to zero, these generators are going to be non-singular only if n is greater than or equal to minus one. So minus one, means that this, this particular thing is zero, you just have del Z and you are fine. 
But say, for example, if you have minus two, then you have a, a one over Z in front of here. And that when you take Z to zero, that is something that is going to be singular, right? So this is only true. Uh, uh, it, this, this, this is only true. This is only non-singular non at Z equal to zero for N greater than equal to minus one. The another, uh, I mean, the other point of, uh, I mean, potential problem is Z equal to infinity. Now, when, uh, if we want to address Z equal to infinity, we uh, perform a change of, uh, I mean, change in variable that we go to, uh, I mean, uh, Z is minus one, one, one over omega, and look at these generators as, I mean, omega tends to infinity. I mean, sorry, tends to zero. So ln, in that case, is going to be given by, by this expression. Uh, this is, uh, I mean, uh, straightforward to do. And now you find, uh, in, in a way very similar to what we argued for above, that this particular expression is only non-singular at omega equal to zero for n, which is greater than, I mean, less than equal to plus one. Again, n equal to one means this, this, this would be, I mean, and this would just be gone, so you're fine. But for n equal to uh, two, three, and so on and so forth, this is not 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 going to be fine okay so only so we find that you know the things that are globally defined on the riemann sphere are generated so the globally defined conformal transformations on the riemann sphere are generated by l0 uh, l and l uh, plus minus 1 so these are the uh, these are the uh, I mean only things that are globally defined. So let's quickly look at what what these guys are. So L minus one, for example, is just going to be uh, translations, right? This is just Z goes to Z plus B, for example. L naught is Z del Z. So these are going to generate I mean transformations of the form Z going to A of Z. Now, if you want to get a sort of a, a geometric intuition of what is happening, it's good to go into polar coordinates. And if you do that, you will find that L0 is, is R, R del R plus I uh, del phi, and L0 bar is you know, uh, R del R minus I del phi, factors of two. So at the end of the day, what you get is that there is this L0 plus L0 bar, which is, it acts as uh, dilatations. And there's I L0 minus L0 bar that acts as uh, rotations. As you'd expect, what is left behind is L equal to plus one, and this uh, corresponds to your uh, you know, the special conformal transformation. For example, you can look at, you know, what L, L, uh, L1 acting on Z is. This does give you minus CZ squared. This is sort of like the, I mean, infinitesimal form of, of this, this guy here. So Z goes to Z by uh, CZ plus one. So uh, together, L minus one, L zero, and L1 generate these uh, transformations, which are of a form Z goes to AZ plus B by CZ plus D. As you can see, if you if you take if you just 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 took uh, you know for the first case uh, so for example uh, if you have uh, A equal to zero uh, C equal to zero D equal to zero. What am I doing? Sorry. Uh, Not all of them equal to zero. So let's say a equal to one, uh, b, b, c equal to zero, and d equal to one. Then this gives you translations for uh, b equal to zero. Yeah, so you can just go on trying trying to do do this. I mean, again and again, for b equal to zero and uh, C equal to zero and Z D equal to one, this gives you uh, scalings. 
And you, you have seen this form, right? Um, this is uh, A equal to one, B equal to zero, C equal to C and D equal to one. This gives you I mean, these uh, special conformal transformations. So the, the point of interest is that the general uh, transformations are going to be of a form like AZ plus B by CZ plus D where A, B, C, D, R, and C, okay? Now, if you want these transformations to be invertible, in that case, AD minus BC has to be, has, uh, you have to make sure that this is not equal to zero. And you can scale these guys such that AD minus BC is equal to one, okay? Uh, this particular expression is also invariant if you take A, A, B, C, D to minus of A, A minus of B minus C uh, minus of D. So this is an extra Z2 symmetry that you need, need to mod out by. So at the end of the day, the upshot is that the conformal group on the Riemann sphere is what is called this Mobius group. This is SL2C modded out by a Z2, okay? This is the one that is, that this particular thing is a set of transformations that are well-defined throughout the plane. And this is what uh, what we are going to call the global group, if you wish, global part uh, part of the app. All right. Now uh, there's this fun thing which are, which we are going to get get to. I mean, again and again, there's this there's something called a central extension. Okay. Now a central extension of an algebra G uh, uh, by by uh, I mean by uh, I mean, by, by C, if you wish, is, is given by the following. So this, this particular, uh, I mean, these, these brackets have to be, uh, I mean, have to hold. So the thing that you need to keep in mind is that if this is the usual algebra with some extra stuff, okay? With some extra stuff, here C is going to be, uh, I mean, a, I mean, complex number, and P is going to be, some function of x's and y's, okay? Uh, and this, this C, uh, by the uh, virtue of it being a um, complex number, I mean, obviously has to commute with, I mean, all of these guys, and also has to uh, commute with, with, with itself. Now, uh, this seems, if this seems a little abstract, what I'm trying to say is that we are going to allow uh, this, this particular structure in the Witt algebra. Remember the Witt algebra was this, right? And now the small mn's have grown up to, to, to become big, big, big ln's. Now these guys will admit something which is like this. So what is this? This, is, this P is some function of m and n, and this C is some, some, uh, I mean, some number, okay? And we want to uh, demonstrate what the form of PMN would be. And this actually is something that you guys, uh, has left you guys as homework. So what we, for what you need to do is employ, uh, I mean, Jacobi identities and some symmetries. And then you'll find that the form of PMN is going to be something like this, okay? It is n cubed minus n delta n plus n uh, zero. So there is this uh, factor of c over 12 in front of it. This 12 is some uh, normalization factor which is going to uh, be, be a useful thing. So this particular boxed equation, equation 3.11, is what is going to be what is called the Virasoro algebra, and this is one of the most important things that we are going to do in the course. Okay, this is going to be one of the backbones of the course, so you should pay very, uh, very close attention to this. Notice that, uh, you know, there is a central extension with L and N only when N is equal to minus n, okay? So you will have central extensions only for things like L, n, L, minus n. So this is going to give you twice n, L to n plus uh, C over 12, n cubed minus n, and that is 
one. Okay, so this is going to be the only sort that is going to give you central extensions. Okay, so if n and m are not minuses of each other, you are not going to get a central extension. Okay, now I'm going to give you some words which I'm not not going to explain that well. But if if you guys are more math inclined, I I would or you to go ahead and uh, figure this out a little bit more. So the point is uh, the central extension is actually related to something which is called a second uh, uh, cohomology group H2 of the weight algebra. Uh, this H, H2, uh, I mean, act, actually classifies all the central extensions of an algebra G. Um, for finite dimensional semi-simple Lie algebras, H2 is actually equal to zero. And so for these, there would be no central extensions, okay? This is, this is just, I mean, information, I'm not, not going to actually go into the details of this, but, but you know, if you want to look this up, okay? Um, okay, that's one. And the second thing that I wanted to, uh, I mean, point out to you guys is this factor n cube minus n. So n cube minus n is what is n into n squared minus one, which is n into n plus one n minus one. So as you can see for n equal to zero plus minus one, the central term is not there, okay? So this just, points to the fact that uh, this, this particular L0, L plus minus one is still the, I mean, global sub subgroup of, I mean, SL2C modded out by Z2. And as we have seen from earlier, the H2 for these things is equal to zero because it's a finite um, dimensional semi-simple Lie algebra. Hence, you do not uh, expect any central extensions for this. And this is borne out by the fact that PMN is equal to zero for M zero, uh, MN zero and plus minus one. So we will call L zero L um, plus minus one, this global subgroup, if you wish, okay? So this is another thing in terms of uh, terminology. Okay, um, questions so far, let me pause. Uh, Any, I have a question. Yeah, please. Uh, so that SL2, uh, SL2C is the, like the double covering of SO3 comma one, right? So yes. SL2 bar Z2 is just SO3 comma one. Listen. No, uh, see, the thing is that this is, uh, also, I mean, I mean, just modded out by the Z2 as well. Okay. This is just the, uh, I mean, right. I mean, just the Mobius group. No, that's what that SL2 yeah. C bar Z2, like the modded out by Z2 is just SO3 comma one or um, SL SL2 C SL2 uh, C uh, yeah okay. I mean, modded out. Yeah, fine. By... Yes, 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 yes. So you will you will uh, so this this is the thing, yeah. That is that is right. So this this is this is actually um so this is something that, that I did for just, I mean, just the Zs. You'll have an equivalent thing for the Z bars as well. Huh, right, right. Yeah. 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 yeah so, uh, yeah, I mean, you are right. So this is, uh, yeah, so this is SO31, uh, if you wish. I mean, this is as, as, as you would, as you would expect, right? So, I mean, you are, you are in the Euclidean. So you are, you are looking at, at this group, right? You're looking at trying, trying to uh, understand what the, uh, I mean, global group is. So the, huh, I mean, this right. particular, uh, this, I mean, this particular discussion would mirror the one we had in, in, in the general D-dimensional case. There, there, huh. there, remember if, if you had started off with, with something, uh, you know, uh, which, which was, um, which which had a, a signature PQ, then then what what we would have had the I mean the uh, uh, I mean conformal group in that 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 dimension would have been SO 
uh, p plus one. A, a, a Q plus huh. one. Yes. Uh, yeah, so, yeah. so if if you are looking at the Euclidean group, uh, if you wish, in in the I mean two two dimensional case, just the global part of the analysis is always going to I mean uh, give you a so uh, three one in that case, right? Huh. Yes. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that that just fits in well with the fact that we could um, embed it in 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 this um, SO algebra. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Sure. Uh, any more questions? Okay. Um, all right. So we have uh, the Virasoro algebra. And the moment I answer something, my screen refuses to do anything else anymore. So just give me a sec. And I will again do what I have. Okay. Um, yeah. So, I mean, as I said, one of the homeworks would be to try and, and determine how, how you get this PMN. Very good. So let me, let me just try to get to fields for the moment then. And uh, we are, we're going to define a few things. So we are going to define something called, uh, I mean, chiral fields. These are fields that depend only on Z. And these are also called holomorphic fields. Uh, Okay, so I mean another another thing is if you are looking at the I mean uh, conformal dimensions. Uh, sorry, just give me another sec. Yeah. Uh, so uh, if so if if I mean under I mean you know z going to lambda z, this thing scales in the following way where you have these uh, lambda to the, I mean, H's and H bars. So this field is going, going to, uh, going, is going to, it's going to be said that this field has dimensions H and H bar. And these are related to the scaling uh, dimension that, that we had earlier and, and spin by the fact H is equal to, I mean, half uh, delta plus S and H bar is equal to half uh, delta minus S. This you remember, uh, I mean, just just, just occurs uh, because of the fact that you have this, uh, you know, this. I mean, the identification of L naught plus L naught bar with, the, I mean, with the dilatations and L uh, L naught minus L naught bar with with uh, the the rotations. So so in this this case, the spin. So uh, so this this is the reason why why you have this particular identification. And like we had uh, previously, we will say we will now say that this uh, field uh, phi of z is going to uh, if it transforms according to this particular uh, particular relation. Uh, uh, I mean, three point one two. Then it is going to be called a primary field of weight h and h bar. Okay. So this particular thing is very similar to what you had in the case of the uh, quasi-primary fields that we had defined earlier. Uh, the only thing right now is that this is holding not only for L0, L uh, plus minus one, which was the global subgroup, but it holds for all Ln, okay? So this is the difference, if you wish, between a primary field and a quasi-primary field. So as I write, write down below here, if 3.12 only holds for the global subalgebra of, a, I mean, SL2C mod Z2, then phi is called a uh, quasi-primary field. And hence, a primary field is always a quasi-primary field, but the converse is not true. So remember, 3.12 uh, is the thing that defines your primary field. If 3.12 holds only for the global uh, part of the uh, I mean, global part of I mean, of the Virasoro algebra, that is just the SL2C part of it. In that case, it is called a quasi-primary. So a primary is always a uh, quasi-primary, but not the other way around. 
because you might have something which which uh, which you know I mean obeys this for l zero l plus minus one but does not do so for the higher ends. We will get to examples of this very soon, but uh, that's what it is. So this particular thing is an important equation. So let me, um, you know, put this into a box. Okay. All right, so what, what do we do? Now let's look at infinitesimal transformations of these uh, primaries. So if, if we have a primary uh, and we want to look at an infinitesimal transformation, f of z is z plus epsilon z. So what you do, sorry, there's something happening here. Somebody's dropped off, I guess. So uh, what happens is that you, uh, so, so you expand out f of z and uh, you also uh, I mean expand the phi of z and you put all of these things back into 3.12. So once you do that, you will see that phi of z is actually, so it transforms as this, this, this particular thing. So you have just Taylor expanded stuff, right? So, so there's going to be a piece from here and there's going to be this extra piece from here. And when you look at the transformation of the primary field under these infinitesimal conformal transformations, this is going to be given by uh, this, this, this whole uh, equation, 3.13. You see that there is, uh, you know, there is a piece which is H uh, del epsilon and there's epsilon del z, which acts, acts on phi. And there's also the anti hoffman matrix. Okay, so this particular transformation is also, uh, is also a very useful, uh, useful transformation. Okay, that is, um, you know, in a sense, what I was planning to get to for this lecture, but it seems we have a little bit of more, more time in hand. So I can either push forward and say a little bit more, or I could pause to take some questions. Let me pause for a minute, and then uh, if there are any things that you'd like clarifying, uh, like me to clear up for you, or if there are any other questions, please feel free to go ahead. All right, seems to be a rather quiet class today. All right, since I've written some, some, some more stuff, let me, let me try and push through and give you a little bit more. Okay. Very good. So, okay. So what we want to, uh, what we want to do next is we want to talk about something which is very important. We uh, want to talk about the, I mean, something that you guys know, the, I mean, energy momentum uh, tensor or, or what is called the stress, stress tensor. So as you guys know, again, that it can be deduced from the variation of the action with, with respect to the metric. So it sort of encodes the behavior of this uh, particular, I mean, any theory under this change of metric uh, del G mu nu. So let's use this. Let's use this to figure out stuff about, uh, yeah, I mean, implications of uh, conformal invariance. Now let's recall that when we have a continuous symmetry, then by, uh, I, I mean, Noether's theorem, there's always a conserved GMU. Uh, okay, just, just give me a second. I'll, I just need to drink some water. Just give me a second.
Okay, good. So we were saying that we want to uh, look at what the implications of uh, conformal invariance are for the energy momentum tensor. And uh, what we will do is that we will uh, look at, uh, you know, remember that the fact that there is, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, conserved current J2, I mean, J mu for any continuous symmetry. We are interested in some, you know, X mu goes to X mu plus, I mean, epsilon mu, where, uh, I mean, epsilon mu is a form that we, we have learned so far. So, you know, so what, what we will do is we will define J mu as uh, some T mu nu times this epsilon mu, where uh, T mu nu is the symmetric, symmetric energy point uh, uh, tensor. Now, since this is uh, J mu del mu J mu is equal to zero, this is also true for the special case where epsilon mu is equal to some, some constant, right? Okay. This has gone off again. This is weird. Yeah. So uh, here, so I was saying that you know you are you are also going to this is also going to hold true where epsilon mu is. I mean, is not not a variable. It's a uh, 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 and uh, in that case, so for uh, I mean constant epsilon mu we will have del mu j mu equal to zero. And so we have defined it as, as uh, t mu nu times epsilon mu. So, you know, since, I mean, epsilon mu is a, a, a constant quantity, we pull this out. And that means that del mu of uh, t mu nu has to be equal to zero, okay? So that is, uh, you know, the, I mean, conservation, of the stress, stress energy tensor, if you wish, for uh, in in this case, for more general transformations, epsilon mu. What do we have? Uh, so what we have is again, you will you'll have del mu j mu equal to zero. So uh, we have so we have these two terms now, uh, del mu t mu nu uh, and. Uh, when, when, whether del mu acts on the uh, t mu nu or the when del mu acts on the epsilon mu. Now, by the uh, by the argument above, we have seen that this is equal to zero. So we 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 plug this in here. So in in this case, uh, you know, we 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 have uh, we have a zero from the first term, and the second term, since I mean t mu nu is uh, symmetric. We we have uh, we have written it in a form like this. Now you would remember when we are when we are specifically looking at uh, an infinite decimal conformal transformations. This particular guy is act actually equal to eta mu nu times del dot epsilon. So what you get is uh, that t mu nu into eta mu nu. Uh, that times del, del dot epsilon is equal to zero. So th this, so the trace of t, uh, I mean t mu nu, that is t mu mu uh, times uh, del dot epsilon has to be equal to zero. And this has to hold for arbitrary infinitesimal, I mean e of z, right? So then what we have what we have at the end of the day is that we are going to I mean conclude that the energy momentum uh, tensor for a conformal field theory is traceless. So T mu mu is equal to zero. Okay. So this is what, what we are going to find at the end of the day. Now uh, this whatever we have said so far is actually a classical, I mean. Classical statement. I, I told you a bit about you know uh, things that are um, classically true, but quantum mechanically they, they do not hold. These are things called I mean anomalies. 
and you will see that the trace of of the stress energy tensor uh, not uh, you, you know that that particular thing is something uh, that leads to uh, the while anomaly uh, which some of you are uh, going to be looking at in uh, your you know project in the course so that that should be that should be an, an interesting I, I should i would have a little bit more to say about this uh, sometime um, in in the next few few lectures but we come to the i mean uh, we 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 uh, we find that uh, this when we are looking at uh, cfts uh, classically what what happens is that this this uh, we are we are going to get that this t mu mu is actually equal to zero okay so um, that is basically where I wanted to reach uh, today. And um, we can also very quickly, yeah, this is something that I do not have the notes for yet because I was actually assuming that some of you are going to ask me some questions um, and I have gone reasonably quickly so let me let me just recap and let me let me just look at what we have done so far so uh remember that we started off uh, today's lecture by looking at uh this the usual form of the so so you know the analysis that we did for uh, the general d dimensions given by equations 2.4 and uh, 2.5 when you specialize to d equal to two, this just boils down to this you know, and CR conditions. And this, what, this uh, meant that, you know, so as you know, that a complex function whose real and imaginary part satisfy this equation is a holomorphic function in some open set. And we, we've, uh, uh, I mean, figured out that since, uh, I mean, epsilon z is is a holomorphic function, so f of z of uh, which is z plus epsilon z is also going to be going to be a going to be a holomorphic function, and this uh, this I mean holomorphic function gives rise to an infinitesimal to the uh, transformation of z going to f of z. The scale factor turns out to be the mod squared of uh, del f del z. So uh, what we did is then we we uh, we performed the LoRa expansion of f of z around z equal to zero uh, by assuming that this is going to be in general a meromorphic function. Uh, I mean epsilon z is going to be a meromorphic function with isolated singularities outside this particular open set where we had defined it at the beginning. And we saw that you know for these things the uh, generators of this these particular infinitesimal transformations were given by this ln and ln bar. Uh, so this closed on to something which was called the Witt algebra, given by 3.9. Here there were two two copies of the Witt algebra. So this particular thing is called the Witt algebra. The rest of it, it and this has to um, commuting copies of the Witt algebra. So we saw that the algebra of infinitesimal conformal transformations in d equal to two is infinite dimensional. Very good. Then we, we went on to trying to understand which ones are, which ones of these, uh, you know, LNs are globally well-defined. And for that, we went, went, went to the Riemann sphere. And, and there we saw that, you know, uh, we, we had these two things where we, if we looked, looked at z equal to zero, these LNs could only be non-singular for n uh, greater than or equal to minus one. For z equal to infinity, we saw that they, they could only be non-singular non for n uh, less than or equal to plus one. So the only uh, globally defined, uh, I mean, uh, conformal transformations were generated by L1 L minus one and L zero. This forms what, what is called the, so, so L minus one generates translations. L naught plus L naught bar as we saw generates uh, 
dilatations and L naught minus L naught bar generates rotations and L plus one corresponds to SAT. So, I mean, all, all <laughs> taken together, this forms what's, what's uh, what, uh, you know, the transformation Z goes to a Z plus B by CZ plus D. This is, this sort of gave the conformal group on the Riemann sphere, that is the Morbius group, which is SL2C modeled out by Z2. Now I said that there, there could be, there, there could be some uh, central extensions uh, to this, uh, I mean, to this particular algebra, central extensions of, of an algebra G by, uh, by C was defined by these particular brackets that I had here. Uh, when applied to the, uh, I mean, Virasoro algebra, we are going to get something of the sort where it can expand it in modes. This, this, is, uh, this is what we get in the sense that we, we, we could uh, essentially have something like uh, C, some, some, some number C into some function of M and N. And I left this as an exercise for you guys to do that, you know, you can employ, I mean, employ the closure under Jacobi identities to figure out what the form is and the form of, of the central extension uh, is the one, one that I've circled here. So that's, uh, that's, the, that's the upshot of this part. Uh, this this part of our our uh, I mean our, our discussions. Um, so the uh, central extension. Uh, so then then what what I just briefly mentioned was that the central extension is related to the second cohomology group uh, H two of the with algebra and this I mean actually in uh, general H two actually classifies all the central extensions. We unfortunately will not be doing more, but I, I mean, encourage you, you, you to explore this. Uh, I also mentioned that H2 is zero for finite dimensional semi-simple D algebras. Uh, there you have no central extensions. And, uh, uh, you know, just, just looking at, uh, at the, the functional form that we have out here, we saw that this was equal to zero when N is equal to zero plus minus one indicating the fact that the global subgroup, uh, I mean, SL2C uh, mod, mod, mod Z2 does not admit any central extensions, which is also, you know, uh, which, which also is, is in keeping with this statement that we had made earlier, um, because this is a finite dimensional semi-simple D algebra. All right, so that, that was that for, for, the, um, for the algebra and, and the, uh, globally well-defined well, well uh, sub subalgebra. We next went on to uh, try to define what uh, chiral fields were, what conformal dimensions were, and finally and most importantly, we define what primary fields were. And this was 3.12. This particular equation uh, defined for you uh, what a primary field of weight h and h bar is. What I try to stress is that when you want to look at this only for the global subalgebra sub, sub of SL2C mod Z2, that is this holds for L0, L plus minus one, then 3.12, if, if this phi satisfies it only for L0, L plus minus one, then L phi is called a quasi-primary field. So the upshot of this was that a primary field is always a quasi-primary field, but the converse is actually not true. Uh, finally, uh, well, uh, we, we, we tried to look at what the infinitesimal conformal transformations of the primaries were. I mean, they, uh, so for that, you just needed to expand out in the right, right ways, and, and, and then you would have ended up with 3.13. Um, and, you know, finally, at, at the end of the day, we were interested in trying to understand what the energy momentum, uh, energy momentum tensor of uh, our CFT, uh, what, what, what properties that may have. So what we did was we uh, 
quickly it was showed that you know del mu uh, t mu nu is equal to zero that's that's something that 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 obviously is well known but when we looked at the more general uh, transformation epsilon mu which depended on x we found that uh, in this case the trace of this has to be equal to zero so, so the trace of t mu nu I mean, has to be equal to zero for an infinitesimal, I mean, arbitrary uh, transformation uh, labeled by this uh, epsilon of z. So we came to the uh, conclusion that in a CFT, the energy momentum tensor that you have is traceless. Uh, you, I mean, I try to stress that this is classically true. Um, this is classically true and my thing is stuck again. Let's see. So we are, we are going to have more things to say about this, um, you know, as we go ahead next time around. But I think so far, this is what I wanted to do for the class uh, today. Um, and uh, this will be a good time for you guys to ask any more questions that you might have. Or if you don't, then we will just reconvene next time. Call for questions. Okay. So uh, today that was it, and we are going to be moving on to uh, you know quantum mechanical aspects as well from next time around. So let's see how far we we can go this week, and uh, then we will take it from there. So all right. So that's uh, basically what I had to say for the class uh, today. Um, we will be seeing you all on Wednesday again, and um, that's about it. Okay, it seems that there are no questions today, so if there are not, then uh, I am going to end this class for for the day, and uh, let's let's again reconvene next time around okay let me stop sharing screen how do i do that sorry what is happening this here very good so all right then um i am going to end this for all of you bye bye